I'm, I'm looking forward to presenting this material today. Uh, we've got some, we've got a great guest speaker with us today on our Go Solus webinar. Uh, thank you for joining. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for taking your precious time with us uh, today. Uh, just uh, let me give you a little bit of background about me and uh, our company. Uh, probably more than eight years ago, I learned the sustainability concept from Mettler Toledo, a $2 billion global leading manufacturer. Later on, I left the corporate, joined Jinlong Solis, had a wonderful journey following our founder, Jimmy Wong. Today, Jinlong Solis is the largest public trading company with a sole focus on PV string inverters. In last year, 2019, we shipped about five gigawatt PV string inverters to more than 100 countries. Solis means song in Spanish. Uh, I chose Go Solis as our webinar series name He's here with us today. Um, about five years ago, Sun, Sun Run introduced me to join SunSpec Alliance. I saw Tom Tensey at that time, and I was always amazed by this uh, nurturing solar ecosystem built by Tom Tensey and his team over a long period of time. My friend Susan told me yesterday, he said, I think Tom has done more for the solar industry than just about anyone. Mm -hmm. I actually felt the spirit of open, transparent, and collaboration at the SunSpec. And last summer, Tom and I met in a beautiful garden in a peaceful hotel uh, near San Francisco. We talked about the Solis uh, collaboration with SunSpec. And time fast forward, I feel very grateful Tom is with us today. I always want to learn one thing or two from Tom. I hope you can learn some from him as well. Hey, Terrence. Hey, please. thank you, Susanna. Uh, and thank you, Tom, for joining us today. We look forward to this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, so let me go forward here with the agenda that we'll be covering today. Uh, well, I'll just do a short brief uh, on Solus and we'll talk a little bit about the SunSpec Alliance organization, uh, their nonprofit org. Uh, and then we'll get into how SunSpec is really driving the adoption of these standards and codes. It's, it's most important work, the stuff that Susanna was just talking about there. And then we'll get into some of the newly implemented state and national standards that installers and buyers and designers really need to know about as they're specifying equipment for new systems being installed on the grid. Uh, we'll pick it up, to, to Travis and I, on our own uh, smart inverter functions and uh, rapid shutdown solutions, that sort of thing that uses the SunSpec uh, protocols. Uh, and then we'll get back to Tom talking about the project registry and, and the PKI, the security programs that they have in place. And we'll do a little Q&A afterwards for anybody who has questions about the material that we're covering today. Uh, look forward to that. Uh, now, today, uh, you know, Jin Long is a publicly traded company. 
Um, and we've had over 15 years of supplying wind inverters and PV string inverters. You can see our factory there uh, in that picture. Of course, there's solar all over the roof. I, I love that, Tom. And, uh, that we, and we've been uh, supplying PV inverters since 2008, and we've converted our wind inverter factory actually over to PV, and then we're going to be expanding that. So Solus is ready on a global basis to supply inverters to markets around the world. Uh, kind of a fun fact, we were the first Chinese PV string inverter company here in the U.S. to achieve that UL1741 uh, certification back in 2009. And, and uh, we are uh, flying under the radar, I suppose, uh, uh, as we are a large white label provider for a uh, PPA provider here in the U.S. and a, another uh, PV module manufacturer, EPC, in North America as well. So uh, we have also uh, offer our product through distribution under the Solus name. And this is where we make them. This is going to be the new 20 gig factory. We're really happy about that. That's uh, uh, going to give us much more scope, uh, much more capability to supply our customers around the world. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Tom. Tom, can you speak a little bit about becoming real. Uh, we have about 110 members now, not that I'm counting, but I do every day. And we have over a thousand adopters and partner organizations. Uh, we have quite active groups in a variety of different functional areas. Of course, in, uh, in the SunSpec Modbus, which relates to our uh, smart inverter and our energy storage initiatives, that's a, a core initiative. Uh, we have another initiative on the 2030.5 standard, IEEE 23.5. That's the uh, also U.S. national standard and the state standard in, in California. We offer testing and certification there. And so that's another one of our activities in cybersecurity, operations and maintenance, uh, et cetera. Each one of these interest groups, we have somewhere between 250 to 500 uh, participants. So the collaboration is, is strong. Um, the reason I believe it's been so strong is that SunSpec tends to work uh, in, in the cracks and the margins within the technology industry. And so we cover those parts of R&D that uh, our member companies alone probably couldn't or wouldn't want to foot the whole bill for. But we pool our resources, pool our knowledge, and solve these common problems. And, and that's what we're focused in on. We are a, a nonprofit trade alliance. Uh, that's how we support ourselves is through member dues. We also do quite a bit of, of work with uh, various state agencies and uh, countries, of course, in terms of grid policy and the like, and that helps sustain us as well. Uh, we have a couple of standards that we have uh, grown organically. SunSpec Modbus, which is now part of the core IEEE 1547 standard, and uh, also the Orange Button standard. So this is an application level data exchange standard for solar and distributed energy. So this is a project that was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. And it's now about three years in, in operation, has a, a complete working uh, taxonomy of over 4,500 terms and an API to boot. information processing and ARM, uh, IEEE 
is there an appropriate standard that we may use to fill, to fill this void? And when one does not exist, then we create one. And the example of the SunSpec Modbus is, is, uh, is exactly that. Uh, when we got started, the, the problem we were working on is how to make the equipment in a solar array talk to other parts of the system in a standardized way. Uh, so I was working at a company and that we were selling monitoring systems. And one of the main jobs that my engineers would do would be to write device drivers for inverters and for meters, and all manner of class of balance of system. And it was ridiculous because it seemed like every order was pending upon writing a brand new interface. And it was oh, wow. And so, you know, I had come out of the, the computing industry. I'm well aware of the standardization of things like printers and <laughs> how drivers works and so forth. I've taken part in those standardization efforts and said, hey, we can do better than this. So we started SunSpec Alliance back in, in 2009 with the original 16 companies that, that agreed with us. Yeah, they, it turns out that the equipment suppliers weren't any more eager to involve in custom integration than we were sure. uh, in, in order to fulfill the, the customer requirement. So that's how SunSpec Modbus started. And from there, it, uh, it has been incorporated into the IEEE 1547 standard in 2018. And, uh, and actually, in when was it about 2012, the country of Denmark uh, incorporated into their grid codes. In 2019, the country of Poland, which I understand is one of the, the top uh, territories for solar installations in Europe this year, they've yeah. also adopted SunSpec uh, uh, Modbus as their core standard. So I think you're going to see that a lot in equipment going forward. It's the most prevalent interface that exists in, in equipment today. The Modbus is, is I should say, and then uh, SunSpec get, gets adapted on top of that. Um, another example is the I2030 dot, or IEEE 2030.5 CSIP standard, so Common Smart Inverter Profile. And uh, so this IEEE 2030.5, well, it got its life uh, uh, it, back at the, uh, in the time when it was a property of the Zigbee Alliance. And in about 2012, uh, SunSpec got involved in the Zigbee Alliance because they were going to separate what was then known as uh, Smart Energy Profile 2.0, now known as IEEE 2030.5. They're gonna separate that technology from their hardware platform. So it was become, becoming a, a software only a standard and a TCP IP standard uh, to boot. And so, uh, Looking at that and the objective of the smart energy profile, it was clear that there were some deficiencies as it pertains to distributed energy. And so SunSpec contributed its information models to that standard. And so in fact, the SunSpec Modbus and the 2030.5 are semant semantically compatible. So that means where you have systems where these two things mix, they, they can speak very well. The signal to noise ratio is quite high. So that's another example of how we, we drive standards. So, so either create a standard whole cloth, as in the case of Modbus, and drive it into the international standards arena, or contribute a piece of the standard and then promote that in the spirit of, again, uh, achieving interoperability, which is what customers ultimately want. Uh, Orange Button, moving on, is an example of a, another whole cloth uh, type of standards development effort. and. Uh, that came about because of a, a need to pull uh, financing into the marketplace. So the Department of Energy said, yeah, we could tap multiple trillions of dollars worth of financing if only we could portray the risk in a standardized way. Mm. And to portray the risk, we need standardized data. And that standardized data should come from data sets from operational systems. And so that's what Orange Button is, operational data set that's derived from the, the core machine standards. And then finally, the SunSpec Rapid Shutdown. This is another whole cloth developed standard. Uh, in about 2015, I guess it was, uh, 30 member companies uh, came to us and said, hey, we need to do something for, for module uh, level safety and uh, provide a signaling system to go along with this. Otherwise, it's gonna be too difficult to implement NEC 2017 because you'd have to roll a truck every time you shut down the array. So can we get together and define an open solution for that? And then, so we did, uh, starting in 2015, we started writing that standard. 2017, we published it, went through a maturation process. And as you'll see today, it's a, 
the uh, ecosystem is alive and well and growing. Yeah, and this example of that, the, we have the SunSpec certified products that now is uh, 79 strong. So why do we offer certification? Well, the, the three points on the right kind of say it all. The idea is to give the consumer freedom to choose amongst compatible brands. If you can do that and it integrates well, you end up with lower system support costs mm -hmm. and ultimately higher stakeholder satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And wh which means that to, you know, fewer things to, to worry about, less reliance on any one particular piece of the equation. I would say it, it actually offers an even bigger benefit, which is with this standard platform, you can now see uh, providers like Jinlong, for example, offering value added services on top of these core standards. So in, uh, in Modbus, most mature product, we have 51 product lines from 35 vendors, 2030.5 CSIP, this was driven by the California Rule 21 deadline, which is coming up on June 22nd. So we now have 19 products from 15 vendors and, and more in the pipeline. And the, the really the newest certification program, the rapid shutdown, we now have nine vendors in the program and more in the pipeline. Uh, excuse me, six vendors that have been all the way through the process with nine products and then more in the pipeline. So the whole the idea here is that when you see the SunSpec uh, brand and certification, it means something. It means it's been tested and verified and held to a higher standard. This is a, a, a slide that originally came from, from EPRI, and then of course we've uh, adopted it for our purposes as well. Uh, SunSpec was involved in, in building up these smart inverters and in navigating this uh, uh, array and this maze of, of different regulations. So this is one of these types of charts that uh, for a newbie to the industry, you kind of want to take a picture of it and then just uh, stuff it away because refer to it every once in a while because uh, it, you, you know, there's so much talk about regulations and codes and so forth in this business. And you often wonder, at least I did, where is all this stuff coming from and how does it all work together? And uh, you know, it's, it's in, in some ways it's a, uh, uh, it's a lesson in U.S. civics, of course, because you have the local laws that are governed by the state laws, but are ultimately governed by the national laws. But then, of course, each of these parts uh, acts uh, independently of, of one another. Uh, and, and each one has sort of a different responsibility. And so starting at the local level, I mean, that group of authorities having jurisdiction, they're about implementing municipal codes. And quite often they're involved in utility generator connection agreements. Uh, that's not entirely true because state level, we also have uh, individual utility generator connection agreements. These are interconnection rules. And examples of that would be Hawaii Rule 14H, California's Rule 21. Uh, other states are de developing their new rules now. And so what they uh, look at at the state level is they can pick and choose from the national standards. Of course, they have to implement the stuff that's required uh, federally. They're free to add additional requirements at the state level. So that's how the states fit in. At the national level, this is uh, in, my, in, in great part, this is about setting a policy overall for the entire framework. And then you have a, a NERC and FERC, which are responsible uh, amongst other things for the cybersecurity of these types of systems. Uh, they also specify the National Electrical Code and so forth. Uh, they, the, the national standards typically uh, will be looking one level up to standards for testing. And so, for example, the, uh, the uh, U.S. Energy Act of 2006 is the uh, act that uh, required the IEEE 1547 as the core standard for all, all DER. And so that's why you see on the top line all these references to IEEE 1547. That's, that's embedded into that particular law. And uh, the new for, for 2018, 2019, actually it's becoming live now in 2020 as the test, testing standard is refined for IEEE 1547, IEEE 1547.1, which will be published just within the next couple of months. Well, new for, for this uh, go round is a requirement for data communication from the system to the utility level. So 
what the heck is this 1547.1 grid interconnection standard? The thing that's in the printing press at IEEE now, waiting for somebody to hit that button and, and <laughs> you off of those copies. Literally, I have this conversation with these IEEE guys. So it must be once a month. And that's what, uh, what I understand the status is. Everything's been approved. They just need to, to maybe uh, dot a few more I's or something and start to roll the press. So what the 1547.1 is, it, it's the testing criteria for the core 1547 standard. And so what's the 1547 standard? Well, it is a standard that applies to distributed energy resources. And so any of these resources that a manufacturer or owner wants to put on the grid, they have to comply to these standards. It makes sure that, uh, that, the, uh, the, uh, that the equipment being installed doesn't interfere with normal grid operation, uh, cause more errors and things of that nature, support voltage as, as is indicated here. And so as I said, the 1547.1 is the test procedure to determine how uh, that equipment complies. And really the, uh, the featured uh, uh, test here on 1547. overall, I would say is the uh, smart inverter compliance test. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually not uh, necessarily an equipment standard. However, the industry uh, interprets it as one. And so you'll hear 1547. I mentioned in the equipment more than any other place. So what's IEEE 2030.5? Well, it is one of these communication interfaces that a DER may support uh, to achieve compliance to 1547. Uh, the others are Modbus, Sunspec Modbus, and DNP3. And I, I would say that uh, uh, it's going forward, you can expect Sunspec Modbus to be very commonly implemented at the device level. Why is that? Well, devices have Modbus interfaces already, and Modbus itself is a so-called non-routable pro protocol. So it's, it's more uh, appropriate for in the array types of communications. So having making sure that your meter and your inverter and your energy storage and so forth all communicate in the same way in the system. That's the purview of these uh, field area networks like Modbus and Sunspec Modbus. IEEE 2030.5, I think, is bound to be the most popular system to utility uh, protocol in existence in the U.S. market. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, DNP3, which is also known as I IEEE 1815, is uh, a protocol that's used almost exclusively for utility uh, substations and for utility-owned equipment. So it is a uh, kind of a niche protocol from that standpoint that's more utility focused. Stuff that's owned by independent power producers, you'll see Modbus in 2030.5. And yeah, and so that's the, uh, that's the test profile. Now, what's the significance of this? Yeah, actually, this is a sea change in terms of the way that distributed energy works, this, the idea that communications is required. So why is that? You know, in the past, of course, inverters uh, always had a lot of software for autonomous behavior. Uh, now they can respond to external stimulus. Now it's required that each one of these systems be, be networked and attached. Uh, at last count, there's about two and a half million DER systems installed in North America. And it's, we're growing it to, at a rate where the install base is likely, system count wise, is likely to, to double uh, within about the next 18 months. Uh, each one of those will have a network, and that, so that means that it has, it's a network to manage and it's a network to secure. That's why it's so important. Now, that's the cost of having the network. The flip side, the upside is, with that network in place, now you can put these energy resources to more and additional uses to support uh, the grid itself, to allow the customers to participate in arbitrage mechanisms and get money for charging or discharging or using or selling at given times. And all the data communications enables all that. All right, California Rule 21 requirements. Uh, this is a lot of detail. I'll let you uh, study that uh, on, your, on your own. I'll, I'll put it to you in a nutshell. And that is uh, rule, rule 21 has been revised over the last five years. It, uh, it now requires that uh, all systems have the ability to communicate 
uh, the default communication mechanism is IEEE 2030.5. And there, the application of 2030.5 is bounded by something called the common smart inverter profile. So 2030.5 is a very rich standard. It can cover thermostats, it can cover pool pumps and, and the like. In this case, we've constrained it to cover distributed energy, specifically solar and storage use cases only. Uh, come June 22nd, every piece of equipment sold into the California market uh, must be listed on the CEC website. To get on the CEC website, that equipment must prove it can communicate with IEEE 23.5. So this is the template for the country, and you can see that rolled out. Uh, so if you want more information about Rule 21, I would say absolutely go to the CEC website that you see uh, listed. Well, actually, the CPUC website is listed here, but there's also an Energy Commission website. So if you just uh, Google Rule 21, you'll find both the CEC and, this, uh, and the uh, CPUC. At the end of the day, those are your go-to sources of truth on this standard. Now, the problem with that, that or this interconnection regulation, the problem with those sources is that they're extremely dense and difficult to navigate. And so if you want a more concise answer about Rule 21 is about, uh, come to sunspec.org. We have plenty of resources there. At the end of the day, when it comes to breaking any ties about who's got the truth, we defer to the Energy Commission and to the Public Utility Commission. However, we've been tracking this stuff for a good long time, and as Travis can, can attest, we're on the phone with our members all the time to straighten out any sorts of uh, uh, misunderstandings that we might have about this stuff. And there's a lot of stuff potentially to misunderstand. So Very confusing, and you have enlightened me many times, Tom. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, and, and it's, this is one of those cases where uh, collaboration really pays off, right? Because it's very easy to lose individual details. And so uh, many, many different partners help us fill in the blanks. And so that is the advantage of, uh, of networking and creating an ecosystem for a common cause. Yeah. Uh, thank you for going through that time. Indeed, a lot of our audience out there is looking for guidance on where to find the truth on this and what we need to do and what we need to specify in equipment uh, to be in compliance when we get our inspector out there looking for some of these communication capabilities. Uh, here in our own single phase residential inverters, uh, we have integrated the SunSpec uh, PLC signal generator into our products, uh, actually across the entire product line. You see our single phase inverters there, but also all of our inverters include the SunSpec Modbus. Uh, so, uh, there's, you know, this particular inverter has some unique features to it, uh, it but it, in the end, it's, it's a reliable grid support inverter. It's a PV string inverter, uh, pretty tough, but uh, indeed it has that compliance and compatibility with other su the SunSpec universe out there. Uh, Travis, you want to talk a little bit how we put that into our hybrid? Oh, sure, Terrence. Hey, everybody, and uh, I just wanted to say I like your new haircut, Tom. It's looking. Uh... <laughs> I like the summer haircut. You're on mute, buddy. You're on mute. I was going to say, for those of you who know me, <laughs> I've had long hair since I was 14 years old. Uh, I, I gave myself a little trim, and it kind of uh, went to the dog, so to speak. <laughs> hey, you know, it's hard to find a barber nowadays, right? So, <laughs> um, Anyways, it, you're looking here at our new, uh, brand new hybrid inverter. We're really extremely excited to... Um, bring this future technology to the US market. And what you're looking at is what we think will be the normal residential installation of the future. So you have your high efficiency panels up here in the left with uh, MLPE, you know, um, module level power electronics, and you got your high voltage, high capacity batteries there when you see the, the LG chems. And, um, and then you also have your high voltage, uh, high efficient hybrid inverter with Sunspec technology for your rapid shutdown for your, for your communication between the batteries and also um, between your data logger and, and above and utilities. And then also going out on the AC side, you have, uh, you know, goes to an external um, uh, auto transformer and then it goes 
to either uh, your critical loads panel or you'll go to like a smart panel that has a built-in auto transformer. And so for us, uh, for our hybrid, we got like a 5 through 10K, NEMA 4X, and uh, go ahead and go to the next page, Terrence. And so I wanted uh, Terrence to throw in this kind of raw picture here, kind of to show like people that are in installers, because we always, uh, people always say we want more, you know, tech talk. And, right. um, and also Terrence, is, we're going to deep dive into the hybrid later in a future um, webinar. But just for now, just kind of show you what you, you will be dealing with. Um, we do, we have some installs going in right now. Uh, we got four DC inputs on the left there. Terrence, can you kind of waver around and show them? Um, and then you have uh, those DC inputs are 1.4 uh, DC to AC ratio. And then next to that, you got your, your battery fusing. And then next to that, so for all of you that hate installing um, RGMs externally, that's a built-in RGM. I save you a lot of time and money uh, putting it into the inverter. And then next to that, it's gonna be your battery uh, connection, the communication inputs. And then uh, behind that little white panel you see there, that's, uh, unfortunately you can't see it, but that's our SunSpec transmitter is behind that. Uh, go back up, Terrence. Yep, I'm sorry, going yep. back. No worries. I just wanted to show them on the bottom there. You, that's uh, our new cellu cellular unit. Uh, and that comes in five or 10 years. And then our big, beautiful display. Uh, this This specific, well, this uh, hybrid inverter, we have uh, three modes. Um, you got your auto self-consumption, your time of use, and then your off-grid. So, uh, like I said, we're gonna get in, dive into this in the future content, but you know, th just to reiterate, this thing is built up with all SunSpec technology uh, coming out of its ears. So, go ahead, Terrence. Thank you, Travis. Uh, indeed, as I noted, our entire product line, including the hybrid that you just saw there and our residential inverter, but it also includes our commercial inverters. They all have the uh, SunSpec uh, standard uh, and installers can be comfortable that uh, you're going to have compatibility with local area communications going forward with these with the SunSpec mod best end. This is really the great benefit to, to uh, getting on this train. Um, we are a grid stabilizing inverter, and of course, we have to cert, uh, certify and get certification to the 1547 and 1547.1. Uh, you'll also look on all of your nameplates of your inverters uh, for that UL 1741SA test. Uh, that, that's the new standard for uh, uh, tests for these grid support inverters. Uh, on the rapid shutdown side, uh, 991 and uh, suspect for rapid shutdown. On, on our PLC signal generator, and then on the AC side, the Modbus standard. Uh, so, Tom, I wanted to get back into uh, some of the things, that not maybe on that national level here, with uh, with updates happening at the NEC, and get into some rapid shutdown stuff. Tom, sure, absolutely, great. Yeah, with uh, the calendar turning to January first, twenty twenty, the number of states that are now covered by the uh, uh, Module level rapid shutdown requirements, I believe, is uh, 33, if, if memory serves me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that includes. I think it's a, a major long-term trend. I, in fact, I know it is. Uh, one plug I'll put in for another program we're doing for the Department of Energy. We're developing a curriculum, a total of nine different courses having to do with uh, networking standards and cybersecurity that pertain to DER. So this program just got started rolling. Uh, the first two classes are being made available this, this summer. Uh, DER and cybersecurity fundamentals are, are offered at the UC San Diego, and there will be specialized uh, training that will be for uh, practitioners, for installers, in, in dealing with uh, with the technology at the level that you deal with it, which is uh, installing it at the uh, on the field site and checking at the field site. 
So that's all coming, and I think that this uh, portends a, a much smarter PV and distributed energy systems in the future. We are uh, launching a major initiative for rapid shutdown, and so we're having a webinar uh, for members on the May 12th. If you are a member, if you want to be a member, give me a buzz or email me, tom at sunspec.org, and learn out of, all about it. Uh, we're putting quite a bit of money into this. So we have uh, seven uh, sponsor members that are uh, promoting this. So, so this is an in the channel promotion and to help educate uh, uh, the industry as to what the issues are and what potential solutions are. So you can learn more about that and just, again, write me, call me, tom at sunspec.org, and ask me about the uh, webinar happening on uh, May 12th. There's other stuff to come after that, but this is the launch webinar for this initiative. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, we also, of course, as we're, we're Sunspec on the DC side on for rapid shutdown. We are certified with um, Sunspec and, well, I'm just showing one of the units, one of the receivers that it's a Sunspec module level rapid shutdown device. This one happens to be by AP Smart, uh, one of the partners that we're using at, or encouraging people to check out. Uh, but really any rapid shutdown device that uh, Sunspec compliant could be used with our um, products. You could almost mix and match. That's some of the beauty and some of the versatility and, and uh, a capability that, uh, that an adopted standard can give to our, to our installers and to the folks that are designing these systems. You can see here how um, you just install one of the devices on the, on the module when you haul it up to the roof and the integrated PLC signal generator will communicate with that device automatically. So there's no setup or no uh, discovery process or anything like that. It's a simple, small device that communicates with a, with a standard signal from our inverter. And so uh, it not only speeds up install, but it makes things easier and of course safer for homeowners and firefighters. Uh, Tom, I wanted to get into a little bit more of that security issues that you were talking about there. You bet. Well, we're not talking about rapid shutdown now. Now we're talking about back on system to utility communication. All right, so this has been pioneered and actually in Hawaii was the first to actually connect their systems to the uh, back to the utility. California is now coming on board in a very big, big way. And so the way that in which these systems will be connected is via the IEEE 2030.5 system. So that system and that standard requires the use of digital certificates and with uh, strong uh, ciphers. With, so this is to offer data security for information that's transmitted over the wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, that type of a, a system, uh, there's actually a standard um, in amongst various uh, TCP IP based protocols of which 2030.5 is one. Uh, that standard is a de facto standard. It's called Transport Level Security 1.2. Uh, that's what's implemented in 2030.5. And again, that uses uh, dis digital certificates with, uh, with strong uh, ciphers. So the way that uh, it relates to this illustration here is that customers come to Sunspec to have their product certified. So the, the, the process for getting certified is of course, folks join Sunspec. We provide them with a, a setup kit so they can get test certificates. And then they put their product through its paces in their own internal labs. They use a, a test and validation uh, set of scripts that Sunspec also provides them to do that internal uh, validation. Also use third-party tools for that. Once the product is, they believe it's in the position to be evaluated, the company would send their, their product or make their product available to an authorized testing laboratory. Sunspec has eight of these authorized uh, testing laboratories and any of them are the brand names that you know uh, for doing safety testing as well. And then we have some communication specialists. But in any case, a third party test lab would evaluate the product to the standard. 
They would send the test results back to SunSpec. We only look at the results. Based upon the results, we say pass or fail. Mm -hmm. For those that pass, we then allow these manufacturers to participate in what is called the public key infrastructure. And so one of the rights and responsibilities uh, being in part of the public key infrastructure, a right is you get the right to put digital certificates into your devices at the factory. Your responsibility is that you must, inter must interact with the root authority to get certificates in bulk, and you must be responsible such that the certificates don't get stolen or lost because they're, they're a valuable commodity and a key component of the security system. And so, uh, so what this is uh, intended to illustrate is the relationship between uh, testing and certification and the security which we're all seeking. Now, is with a, a network of critical infrastructure DER resources that quickly is gonna be measured in the millions of units, those that are connected via networking, uh, this is an important uh, aspect for the industry to to get right to to make sure that uh, uh, that the consumers have the utmost confidence in their investment in distributed energy. And it's that confidence level that we're really uh, that that we're looking for, and and of course, you know, we have security issues wherever we go. So it's really wonderful that. Uh, SunSpec has got this program rolling for this. Uh, one last thing I wanted to bring up was this, uh, your product certification registry, Tom. Sure. Yeah, thank you for that. This is a new service that we've rolled out. And the product certification registry, it, uh, it, it covers all of the different standards and the product types that we cover. So you can see that you can search and sort by, uh, by component type. What you can't quite see there is it, we also allow you to search by SunSpec certification type, and that's for Modbus 23.5 or rapid shutdown. And in this particular case, we focus the uh, the website to just give us the rapid shutdown results, and it's it's highlighting Jinlong Jin Solis. Uh, now, for those of you that are familiar with the California Energy Commission website uh, for inverter listings, uh, one, one of the things that you'll recognize, it's important to get on that list, otherwise you can't sell their, your product. Uh, but it also contains some important information about these products that describes why and how they got on the list. And that's usually uh, embedded in something called the Protocol Information Conformance Statement, which you can see listed at the bottom of the uh, sole lease listing and the certificate itself. Uh, these two pieces of data will let you know uh, what a version of firmware or software was tested. It provides a checksum. It'll tell you who tested it, which third-party test lab, and in fact, which uh, engineer did the testing on what date they did it. Similar data for when SunSpec certified it. The certificate then is something that, uh, that you'll need to go to, to to determine what product models, in this case for Solis, are covered here. So. They, the, uh, the certifications typically are applied to product lines and for the reason that software or firmware tends to run on an entire line. And so what the certificate does is it lists out all the individual makes and models that are covered by the standard. And so uh, once the product gets the, uh, gets the marking, it's a, it's a forever thing. Uh, the, the, the member plays a part in maintaining it. So as changes occur, we're validating those changes. If, uh, if major changes occur where a recertification would be required, then the manufacturers are coming down, coming back for that service as well. So uh, going forward, again, this is, I think is an important service. We offer it to both to, as an end user service and as an API. So one of the complaints that California has had is that all the other states use its, uh, its registry. So we've offered we think what we think is a better registry, we offer an API. And so, you can use it in-house, states can use it, anybody that wants to can use it. We also think it's a great service and a great registry, uh, that a common one that we can all use. It's, it's a great service, Tom, I think. Well, I, this is the, uh, uh, this was the end of our presentation for today. Uh, of course, we have opportunity here to, to a few minutes left for some questions and answers from our crowd. Uh, uh, anybody got to, uh, uh, some questions out there. Uh, uh, we we uh, are trying to figure out 
all these standards and make sure that we're getting the right equipment for everybody. And uh, geez, I'd, like, I'd just like to thank Travis for joining me today. Uh, thanks, Travis, for uh, jumping on the webinar with us today. Uh, no problem. Yeah, and Tom, uh, Tom, geez, uh, thanks for spending some time with us today and, and explaining some of these. Uh, well, it can be, it can be a bit of uh, intimidating, I think, but once you get into it and once you start to understand some of the different pieces that are involved, then I think it starts to come together and really appreciate what uh, the summary and, and uh, explanations you gave us today. Uh, any well, other concluding thoughts, folks? Uh, on, yeah. Well, we have a question here, actually here, that came in through the Q&A. Yes. Can owners of Solis inverters request access uh, to the same level of telemetry that Solis itself receives from its inverters? For example, internal component operating temperatures, et cetera. Yes, you can get uh, all the data that comes out of uh, each one of the, on a string level from our inverters is accessible. Uh, by our customers. We give them temperature of the inverter, we give them uh, all the data on each string, uh, uh, over time, history, uh, charting capabilities right on that uh, um, right on that big screen. That's one of the really interesting pieces of having such a big screen on there uh, is that you can diagnose things right there on the screen using our charting functions. So yes, uh, that's one of the, that, that uh, open uh, uh, information is part of our, our universe as well, Tom. Great. Well, Terrence and, and Travis, Tony Saucedo says, the single phase hybrid inverter sure is feature rich. When will it be available in the US? We are launching that right now. We got test systems in and uh, thanks for the question, Tony. Um, we got test units in and we anticipate it being available, we're saying this summer. Very good. Uh, we got another question here. Does a rapid shutdown device and inverter need a system certification or is device certification of each enough? Sure, well, the, the, the standard is written so that, uh, that the initiator and the transmitter are separate, separate devices. You know, of course, uh, we encourage interoperability testing. We do interoperability testing all the time, but in terms of the certification, no. You can, can, you can uh, be certified just to one part of the standard, either inverter or, or transmitter. You don't need to necessarily have the system. I can now, back I, I, I offer, I offer one point of clarification. You know, I don't want to lead anybody down the, the road to, to have them think that we have really anything to do with UL 1741 safety testing, because we don't. Uh, the the SunSpec signaling system is, is just that. It's a communication system. And so that's what we are testing for. So now, if, if you were to ask uh, a UL or CSA or Intertech representative about is uh, system testing required for uh, UL 1741SA, you may get a different answer. I don't know. But for SunSpec, you can uh, uh, just go for one part of the, of the solution. Mm -hmm. And for us, we take it a step further and we do a system certification just to ensure those components work together. Well, yeah, yeah, this is this is a way that I think that uh, that vendors can differentiate as well, right? I mean, this is right. the, the whole point of the standards allow you to to do your own thing. I think that's all the questions we have, Terrence. That's excellent. I mean, the versatility that really that gives us is 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 notable. I I think it's I really learned a lot today, and I hope that our audience also was able to help help you under un, untangle some of these different certifications and different programs that are out there and different things that you can take advantage of like we have here at Solus. We we are a proud member of, of SunSpec and, and look forward to a continuing collaboration. Uh, look for our hybrid inverter coming out here real soon and thank you very much for spending the time with us today. I really appreciate it. Again, thanks Travis, thanks Tom for joining me and I hope all of us uh, have a great week and uh, well in these times I'll, I'll close with stay safe everybody. Uh, wash your hands. <laughs> and wash your hands after this webinar. Thank well, you very much everyone. All Have right. A great